Amen. We should be thankful for all things, but sometimes they're just things that we can't find ourselves thankful for. But uh, they do teach us, they do make lead us, they do help us along the way. This morning is the fourth time that I've spoken on the Apostle Paul. And uh, I have it on my stuff, Paul Point Four. So uh, this is a, a message, uh, the last time I think I'm going to be speaking on the Apostle Paul. I started it because uh, I was wanting, well, I was asked to get into some things that were more doctrinal, and I certainly have. And, uh, you know, you have to have a whole variety of everything. But this morning we're going to talk about the completion of God's message of grace. And there is, with it, there is a twofold purpose in it. First of all, God's giving of the message of the grace of God to the Apostle Paul. That was completed, and we'll get into that again this morning. And then there is the completion of this day of grace and how God is going to wrap up all things. Now, we finished our third message uh, on the Apostle Paul. We were talking about mystery, uh, about the mystery that was revealed to us in uh, his later epistles. And we call these the prison epistles. And, of course, that's because he was a prisoner of Rome at the time that he wrote them. And in the order that they were written, it's Ephesians, Colossians, Philemon, Philippians, 1 Timothy, Titus, and 2 Timothy. And we were careful to say, and we want you to realize this, that they are in no way more important than the first six books that he wrote. Uh, they had mysteries in them too. We looked at that. We looked at the fact that God, that God was speaking through the Apostle Paul from the very beginning of his ministry to the Gentiles. But what makes these books different is at the time that he wrote it, wrote them, there was no more message to the Jews. At the time they were written, God had turned aside from Israel as a nation, but not from Israel as an individual. And as Paul says, he set the nation aside for a season. Now, you may not have noticed, but each one of these lessons that I've had on the Apostle Paul, I've used Ephesians 3, 1, 2 through 12 as our scripture reading. And each time, we've always taken something out of it. And today is not going to be any exception. Uh, because in Ephesians 3, we have the mystery of the church as one body composed of both Jews and Gentiles. So let's turn there in our Bible. Ephesians, the third chapter, and starting with the first verse. I always used to wonder why my, well, I really knew why, but my Bible's always got worn out in this part of the scripture. And uh, I noticed when I collected all my dad's old Bibles that you look through any of them, and they're the same way. You begin to get into these epistles, and man, they're just worn out. The edges are all frayed and everything else. But uh, we want to look here at Ephesians 3 and uh, and we want, to, we want to look at some of these things here. Ephesians 3, 1. For this reason, I, Paul, the prisoner of Jesus Christ for you Gentiles, if indeed you have heard the gospel or the grace of God, which was given to me, how that by revelation he made known unto me the mystery. Now, the question for, the, for today is, have you heard of the dispensation of the grace of God? Now, I look out in this audience, and I don't have to wonder. Uh, I don't see a lot of hands going up, but I, you say, well, that's obvious. We, we talk about that regularly, and we do. Well, it says it was given to Paul. It was given to him to pass on to you and to me. And so since you've heard it, I guess he was faithful at passing it on. And uh, that is true. Uh, he tells us that by revelation, he, that is Christ, made known unto him the mystery. And, uh, and we find that uh, 
the Lord Jesus Christ is the one that gave him this. We covered that in a previous message. The fact that it was the Lord himself, the risen Lord, that gave him this message that he was to take to the Gentiles. Now, we note in this uh, passage here in our scriptures, in verses 3 and 4, there's a parenthesis. Now, it's always kind of a learning process. Sometimes these parentheses give us something of interest, but often they just confuse us because we go back and we lose track of what we're reading when we came to the parentheses. And uh, we want to think of that for just a minute. It's always a learning process to analyze what's inserted and then go back and see how it works without it. But here's what the insert was. The insert here is how that by revelation, he, am I right? Wait, one, three, two. Yeah. How that by revelation he made known unto me the mystery, he says then, as I have briefly written already, by which when you read, you may understand my knowledge in the mystery of Christ. So this little inserted bit of information is uh, really to those that originally the letter was written to. And uh, it's important to us, too. First of all, he's already written to them about the subject. And he wants them to under understand better his knowledge in the mystery of Christ or what God told him that was uh, for the Gentile, the, the message that he was supposed to preach. Now, there's conjecture among the scholars whether he's referring to one of the epistles that he's already written or to writings that we don't have. He says he only briefly mentioned it. He must have had piles of correspondence. It clearly states that the purpose of his writing here was that he wants them and us too to understand what God revealed to him. And uh, one might say the revealed secret. In this passage, he wants, uh, wants them to understand what they should know about the mystery of Christ. Now, it's a shame that most, shall we say, most who practice Christianity don't know much or really don't know anything. In many churches today, most churches today, if you started talking about the, the unsearchable riches or if you used the term mystery, it would go right over their head. And uh, if they ever did notice it, somebody's explained it away for them. And so that's all there is to it. But now let's go back and we want to see this text. And uh, let's look at it without this uh, abbreviate or this stuff in it. Here he says, For this cause I, Paul, the prisoner of Jesus Christ for you Gentiles, if indeed you've heard of the grace of God which was given to me, how that by revelation he made known unto me the mystery which in other ages was not made known unto the sons of men, as it has now been revealed by the Spirit to his holy apostles and prophets. So here we see the definition of a mystery spelled out. A mystery in other ages not made known unto men. But now it is. Now it is. Notice it's been revealed by the Spirit. Notice it's been revealed to his holy apostles and prophets. Now, Williams, in his student's commentary, he points out that this word now that's used here, it indicates, by the way it's used in the Greek, that it means new, new apostles and prophets. And uh, he points out that these new apostles and prophets are distinct from the 12, because they're the old apostles. Now, this, now that God has turned to the Gentiles, we have new apostles and prophets. You know, we wonder sometimes when we look at the gifts of the Spirit that are given, and we see in several places that he gives prophecy as a gift of the Spirit, even in this age. And we kind of wonder, and yet, those old men before the, all the Word of God had come together, they had to have some way of knowing what this whole doctrine was regarding uh, the regarding the dispensation of the grace of God. And I've often used the illustration, it was many things like, like someone back uh, before Paul even was had gone to Rome, and they're preaching to an audience and they start quoting scripture, like, by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourself. It hasn't even been written yet, but God is using the word in the way he wants to use it. Oh yeah, he could word it differently, but it would be the same same thing. 
And I think it's important that we look at that and think on that, that God has always been faithful in getting his word out in the way he wants it out. Well, here comes what we've been working toward. Verse 6, that the Gentiles should be fellow heirs of the same body and partakers of his promise in Christ through the gospel. Okay, this embodies the mystery that we're talking about here. The church has one body composed of Jews and Gentiles. Now, it wasn't a mystery that the Gentiles should be fellow heirs with Christ, with Israel. In an earthly kingdom, at some point, it was promised in the scripture. And we know that this, uh, what's in this verse is not related, or we know that what is in this verse is not related to what God told Abraham. Because remember God said, in you shall all the families of the earth be blessed. And that's not what's going on here. This is something different from that. What do we see here? Well, we see it's been revealed by the Spirit that the Gentiles should be fellow heirs, that Gentiles should be of the same body, that Gentiles should be partakers of God's promise in Christ. Now, this is different because up to this point, uh, up to the Apostle Paul, nation Israel has always been predominant. The way man came to God was through Israel. That's what we find in the scriptures. And yet at this point now, he's talking about the Gentiles should be fellow heirs. And that was something special. It was something different that, that God was going to work in a different manner. And so we see that Gentiles and Jews should be fellow heirs. We see that Gentiles and Jews should be of the same body. No kingdom mentioned here anymore. And we see that Gentiles and Jews should be partakers of God's promise in Christ. They're going to be equal partners in whatever is going on here. And that's a wonderful thing. But how is this going to come about? It says through the gospel. Through the gospel. What gospel? Paul's gospel. Paul's gospel. Peter's gospel has been set aside at this point in Paul's writings. Temporarily discontinued. Now we consider the mystery of Israel's blindness. In Romans 11, Paul starts out in verse 1. He says, has God cast away his people? And then he quickly answers it. He says, certainly not. Look at me. In the next few verses, he talks about God always having a remnant. Always having a remnant. And he says, there's a remnant according to the election of grace. And he says, if by grace, then no longer works. That is, it's no longer of the law. And as we pointed out before, uh, up until uh, really you're getting pretty close to the end of the book of Acts and you find Jews in the temple they are worshiping, offering sacrifices, keeping the law. Jews that were accepted the Lord Jesus Christ. They accepted him, first of all, as their Messiah. They accepted him as their Savior. And here they were still keeping the law. But now Israel has been set aside. They're, they're this remnant of grace uh, his election of grace, he calls it. And he says, if it's by grace, it's no longer by works. In other words, Jews and Gentiles alike are in the body of Christ. They're all considered equals if they'll simply accept God's offer through faith. He'll save them. As a religious group, we know they've been blinded. Uh, Israel has been blinded because uh, of God's turning away from this. But as an individual, they can still come to him just like anyone else. There's no more special message for the nation Israel. Now we've based this series of messages on Ephesians, the third chapter. And let's uh, move on here as we look at the next couple of verses. Verse 8. We say, to me who am less than the least of all saints, this grace was given that I should preach among the Gentiles 
the unsearchable riches of Christ, and to make all see what is the fellowship of the mystery. Now, Paul, he diminishes himself here, but that was his way. He wants to put God first in all things. It says that grace was given to him so that he could preach the unsearchable things of Christ to the Gentiles. The purpose, of course, he says, was to make all understand the fellowship of the mystery. Uh, we're fortunate that we understand what Paul means, though, when he talks about a mystery. It's that which God did not reveal until he revealed them to the Apostle Paul. And uh, we said several times in, the, in these lessons that it's a shame that so many people don't understand that what Paul says is from Paul because the Lord Jesus Christ told him to say it. And uh, it's what we're talking about here. We use these terms unsearchable or mystery in regard to God's word. Now, of course, you realize that when we talk about the unsearchable riches of Christ, we're talking about things that were not revealed in the Old Testament. And so that there's no way that they can be looked up there. You understand that when Paul calls something a mystery, he's talking about something that was hid in the mind and heart of God and not revealed until God revealed it through Paul. Let's, uh, let's look on. Let's look at this passage again here. We'll put the next verse with it. To me who am less than the least of all saints, this grace was given that I should preach among the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ and to make all men see what is the fellowship of the mystery from which from the beginning of the ages has been hidden in God who created all things through Jesus Christ. Now, we see that this mystery was from way back. It was hidden from way back. And uh, when, when, I, when I was working my way through Acts some time back, I was very careful not to say that the church started here or the church started there. It really is to some degree immaterial. Uh, but I was wanting to be asked because I was prepared to say that it really started in Ephesians 1 in the mind and the heart of God before the foundation of the world. God had it all planned out. And uh, we, we know that through his foreknowledge, he, he knew all about it. So I think that it was there in the mind and heart of God. And anyway, Paul, he's repeating himself here where he says, which from the beginning of the ages was hid in God, because God can keep a secret, can't he? Now, Notice the end of verse 9. It, it ends with a, a truth that must be important because we find it repeated in many places in the, in the Scripture. Mark brought it up last week. And that is this subject here where God created all things through Christ Jesus. Yes, God wants, us to, wants all men to know that creation, you know, what, what has been billions and billions of years of evolving. Yeah. That all creation came through his son, Christ Jesus. And it's important, I think. It must be an important scripture because it's over and over he talks about God, the son, as being the creator. And uh, we, we find that throughout scripture. And Paul, he points out also in Romans 1 here, uh, he points out that man has no excuse because God says of this they were willingly ignorant when it comes to creation. That's, that's what he was saying. They were willingly ignorant. And they can say what they want, but when they stand before God, they're going to be speechless. Speechless. I had thought of trying to find, and I had it from years back, the cartoon, and not a fun cartoon, but a serious cartoon of Carl Sagan standing before Peter when, when, and he's saying, it all came from what? Well, so many people in this world, they just don't understand. It's the way it is. God, Satan's lie is predominant. Anyway, now we come to something bigger here. Uh, we come that God's dealing with mankind in this age, or should we just say this period?
period of time when mankind is on the earth, 6,000 years or so. Uh, but what we often fail to comprehend is what's going on in God's universe. He doesn't tell us much about it, and we must be careful not to assume or to guess at things that we don't know and can't prove and uh, just our speculation. Uh, but uh, we, we had a brief glimpse of God using us for his divine purposes. I think that's a very important part uh, of what we're dealing with here. As we go on to verse 10, he says, To the intent that now the manifold wisdom of God might be made known by the church to the principalities and powers in heavenly places, according to the eternal purpose which he accomplished in Christ Jesus our Lord. Look at this. Think of this. The manifold wisdom of God. The manifold wisdom of God might be made known by the church. That's us. To the principalities and powers heavenly beings we know very little about. In accordance with his eternal purpose. Remember we talked about before the foundation of the world. God had these things planned out. And it's accomplished in Christ Jesus our Lord. I think this is a real, something that really we need to have in our minds. That God is accomplishing more than just saving the sinner. Oh, that's the wonderful part of it for us. But God had in mind, he had all this worked out ahead of time. And it's going to work out in that way. It's the manifold wisdom of God. The collective wisdom of God. All of God's wisdom put together. Made known by the church. God's going to use the church to show his great wisdom. In the second chapter here of Ephesians, we find that we are seated, seated in heavenly places in Christ, where God is going to show us off throughout the ages. Dad always used to use the expression, we're trophies of his grace. He's going to have us up there, and he's going to show us off as you would a trophy. To the principalities and powers. Now, we see that God is going to use us to show his wisdom to the present residents of heaven. What's this all about? Well, it's a realm that we don't know much about, do we? What do we know? We know that even as great nations and great armies are separated tier upon tier of authority upon authority and special positions and things without number, but we know so little about what we have what that we're trying to comprehend here. The principalities and powers in heavenly places. We know so little. In Isaiah 6, we read of the seraphim who are God in God's throne room. They have six wings. They hover there. They cry, cry out, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. In Ezekiel 1, we find the cherubim, similar in a way, but different. They conveyed Jehovah wherever he went. They had four wings, and they had feet that then they had. Well, you get so confused when you get into Ezekiel and you just begin to read about all the wheels going around him within the wheels. But what is it all about? We can't even imagine what it looks like. And there it is. And, of course, we know of Lucifer, who was God's great choir and praise director. What was he? Covered with precious stones of all kinds. Someone has said that he's a great reflector of the glory and the praise of God. But he certainly wasn't a generator of it. He didn't produce any of it. We have Gabriel the angel or messenger who stands in the presence of God. We see him coming on God's behalf in many cases through the scripture. We have Michael, who's the archangel. What is an archangel? We don't know. 
He's also the prince of the kingdom of Israel. He's going to be leading the armies of heaven in the future. Then there are principalities, such as the prince of the kingdom of Persia, the prince of the kingdom of Greece, which we read about in the book of Daniel. And it says principalities and powers. What are powers? I have no answer. There are angels. And that seems to cover a multitude of things because we find them with different things that they're doing. You even find them in the book of Revelation. There's the, the, the angel of the church of whatever. We don't know. There are demons. They seem to be disembodied spirits. We don't know much about them. We just know that they exist. Evil spirits are spoken of in the Gospels. They seem to be different. They seem to be different types. Some of them cause this. Some of them cause that dumbness and different things. And remember, the apostles were called upon to cast out a demon, and they couldn't do it. And the Lord said, well, this type requires much prayer and fasting. It's different. What's, what's going on? There are watchers. They're mentioned in... Jeremiah, and they're mentioned in Daniel. He talks about the watchers that God has in his word. What are they? Then we find that uh, there are walkers. Walkers? Yeah, who God sent to walk to and, throw, to and fro throughout the earth. Zechariah talks about them there. Walkers. And in Zechariah, we also find the four spirits of heaven. Four spirits of heaven. Yes, and they come out in chariots, and it says the chariots were pulled by strong steeds. What does that mean? They're different colors which represent something. And then one of them is the, the spirit of the north, another is the spirit of the south, spirit of the east, spirit of the west, and they come out in the, there in the Zechariah, and away they go. What are they? What do they do? And there's doubtless many more that we don't know anything about in God's heaven. Now we think of God's handiwork here in this earth and we, we see that he delights in variety. And surely it's the same in the ranks of heaven. We also know that sometime in the past there was an insurrection among the heavenly hosts. Lucifer was filled with pride and he set himself up as God to be worshipped. And we also know that he gathered a following, uh, perhaps a third of the heavenly host. We read that in uh, Revelation, the 12th chapter. And uh, this host that's going to be with him, they're going to be thrown out, cast out of heaven with him. And it says it could be a third of the heavenly host because it says that as the great dragon was cast out of heaven, his tail brought with him a third of the stars of heaven. Well, what do we know about it? Not, it's all just what we read. Revelation 12 tells us there will be war in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon and his angels. It says, so the great dragon was cast out. That serpent of old called the devil and Satan who deceives the whole world. He was cast to earth and his angels were cast out with him. Well, we know that his immediate end will be the bottomless pit. And then he'll be released for a short time. And ultimately, he's going to end up in the lake of fire. And uh, his rebellion will come to an end. And heaven will be cleansed. Let's go back to Revelation. Or Revelation. Let's go back to Ephesians 3. Verse 10 starts out with, To the intent. To the intent. And uh, this means that things done were done uh, with insertion of the following. Let's go to verse 9 here. To make all see what is the fellowship of the mystery, which from the beginning of the ages has been hidden with God, who created all things through Jesus Christ, to the intent that now the manifold wisdom of God might be made known by the church to the principalities and powers in heavenly places. It all wraps up in this mystery. 
which has been hidden in God from the beginning of the ages. And uh, it shows that all things were created by Christ Jesus. And they were created for this intended purpose. God's going to use the church to show all of the beings of the universe his great wisdom in all things. As we said a few minutes ago, Ephesians 2 uh, were used to show off how rich his mercy is. Let's look at Ephesians 2 here. It's across the page in my Bible, maybe back. But in verse 4, he says, But God, who is rich in mercy because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in trespasses, has made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved, and raised us up together, and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ, that in the ages to come he might show the exceeding riches of his grace in his kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. Well, a wonderful passage of Scripture, isn't it? Verse 3 says he blessed us with every spiritual blessing. Verse 4 says that we were prehistorically chosen before the foundation of the world, it says. The word chosen here is to select for oneself. So it was, it was his will that we should be holy without blame before him in love. And uh, we will be there after we've been acquitted of all guilt of sin and iniquity. We'll, we will be there after we have been, been saved completely uh, from the very presence of sin, actually. And verse 5 tells us that he predestinated us. It means to mark out beforehand. He might have, as a group, marked out before him. Before appointed unto the adoption of children by Christ. And it has that idea of son placing or of the Jewish idea, like they use the bar mitzvah, where they are then at a certain age considered by ceremony to become a son uh, of, God, of the, whoever their parents were. And uh, so it will be with us. We have the adoption which we talked about, I think, back in the first time that we talked about Paul's Gospels. And it says then in verse 6 that it's all to the praise and glory of his grace. And uh, the word accepted here in the next sentence really means much graced. In other words, not only were we accepted in the sense that we put it, but we were, had grace piled upon us. And all these riches are imported to us. We see ourselves here seated in the heavenlies with Christ. We're surrounded by heavenly creatures, beautiful, wise, powerful. They've been wondering about God's working among these beings. And, you know, Lucifer was beautiful, wise, powerful. Pride took over. He thought himself equal with God, didn't he? And sin came, and he fell, taking many with him. And they wonder about these creatures that God has brought into his presence. To these creatures to whom God has given the, all the honor of his son. Are they, are they the replacements for those that fell? I don't know. We, however, there in heaven, we're going to have the knowledge that we were nothing. Absolutely nothing just human debris, everything we have then, everything we are then, will be because of the grace of God. We go back to the first chapter of the book of Ephesians. Uh, we find... Where did I go? Wrong here. No. We go back to the first chapter of the book of Ephesians. He says, In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins, according to the riches of his grace, which he made to abound toward us in all wisdom and prudence. In verse 7 here, we have redemption out through his blood, the forgiveness of sins, according to the riches of his grace. And he is rich in grace. 
And in verse 8 here, which he made to abound toward us in all wisdom and prudence, we just, he completely covered us with his grace, didn't he? And if we finish up here with these verses, having made known unto us the mystery of his will, according to his good pleasure, which he purposed in himself, that in the dispensation of the fullness of times, he might gather together in one all things in Christ, which are in heaven and which are on earth. So accordingly, he made it known to us in eternity, he's going to gather all things, both in heaven and earth, into one. This means for us eternity in heaven with Christ. We should, this should motivate us, motivate us toward God. It did Paul. That's why Paul, he said he was happy to suffer the afflictions of Christ. He's done it for the sake of the church, the body of Christ. That was the reason that Paul was called to become a minister. It was to fulfill the word of God. Oh, we have so much to think about. What God has done for us. What can we do but love him? Our Heavenly Father, we are thankful for what we have in you. We're thankful of your great love. We're thankful of your great grace that you bestowed upon us. We don't yet understand what we shall be. But we know that when that time comes, we will be there with you in glory. Thank you, Lord, for these things. Guide and bless and direct us now as we go our way. We commit ourselves to you in Jesus' blessed name. Amen.